Return to the Word is made possible by faithful supporters like you. Find out more at returntotheword.com. Welcome to the broadcast ministry of Return to the Word with Pastor Mark Fontecchio, advancing the message of God's amazing grace through the teaching of God's Word. And now, here is pastor and author Mark Fontecchio. I do not believe our work, our study of the local church is done until we have considered the doctrine from the scriptures of the priesthood of the believer in Christ. Now, this might not be a doctrine that you know of, but it is a doctrine that radically transforms your understanding of your walk with Jesus Christ. It impacts you every single day, whether you know it or not. If you ever find yourself in Berlin, I want to encourage you to look down to what is underneath your feet. Because in Berlin, there are four inch by four inch blocks of brass in the pavement. They're easy to miss if you're not looking for them. But once you know they exist, then you begin to notice how often that you see them. Now, each stone is engraved with the name and the fate of a person who suffered under the Nazi regime. They're known as stumbling stones. There's over 8,000 of them in the German capital alone. And tens of thousands of them are spread out across European countries. They mark the individual victims of the Holocaust. Each block begins with the words here lived because each block is actually placed at exactly the last place where the person lived freely before he or she fell victim to the Nazi terror and was deported to an extermination camp. Then the block continues to tell where the person was killed. And it's not just the Jews. There's a block placed for all the victims of the Nazi regime, the disabled, even those who fought back against Hitler including most certainly the Jewish people who died at the hands of the Nazis. The New Testament tells us repeatedly that the stumbling stone that we serve is Jesus Christ. 1 Corinthians 1.23, but we preach Christ crucified to the Jews, a stumbling block and to the Greeks foolishness. And again, from 1 Peter 2.8, referring to Jesus Christ, a stone of stumbling and a rock of offense. The stone that was rejected is precious to God. And this stumbling stone is not only a reminder of the past, but it also helps us to walk forward in freedom. An essential part of walking forward in this freedom is knowing that the freedom we have in Christ, it is knowing that in his sacrifice, he paved the way for us to have direct access to a holy and perfect God in heaven. See, one of the core doctrines that we hold to as a church, that we will always hold to as a church, that we have covered in this church series from Ephesians 3, is that God has different dispensations, different plans for different times in the history of men. We talked about Adam and Eve in the garden, Noah and his boat, and most relevant to our study for this morning, the church is not Israel and Israel is not the church which affects directly our understanding of the priesthood of the believer. See, the doctrine of the priesthood of the believer means that all believers in Christ now share in his priestly status. And because of this, read this with me if you would. There is, number one, no special class of people who mediate the knowledge, the presence, and forgiveness of Christ to the rest of the believers. Number two, all believers have the authority and right to read, interpret, and apply the teachings of Scripture. This is a huge truth from the Word of God. People have died for this doctrine. It is rooted in the teaching of Scripture that there's no longer a special class of priests within God's people. It's rooted in the teaching that New Testament believers share in Christ's priestly status because of our union with Christ. And one of the first things that you see when you read the Old Testament is that after Moses led the people of Israel out of Egypt, God instructed Moses to create a group of priests. 
And it was their role to mediate the knowledge, the presence of God and the forgiveness of God to the rest of the nation of Israel. Part of the good news wrapped up in the New Testament is that Christ has come and fulfilled the priestly role through his life, his death, and his resurrection. He is the final mediator between God and men. And that means through him, we have forevermore, forevermore direct access to our God. So here's what I'm going to tell you. Christian, you are not dependent upon a Catholic priest to interpret the scripture for you. And you are not dependent upon a priest to bless you, to offer you forgiveness of God. It is their pride and it is their pagan traditions that make them think that you need them, but not the scriptures. God doesn't think this for a second. Because one of the things we're going to see in scripture is that every believer is a priest unto God. The ground is level at the foot of the cross. Now, this does not mean there are not pastors and teachers. This does not mean that there's not different roles in the body of Christ. But this absolutely does mean child of God by faith. You have direct access to your God. Your prayers, hear this, take it to the bank. Your prayers are heard directly by God himself. It's like the story of the dying woman. She had been raised Roman Catholic But she was also reading her Bible. Good for her. And she understood new life in Christ. And she understood this doctrine of the priesthood of Christ. And she laid there in the hospital bed in the last stages of cancer, gasping day after day for breath. And she was in great pain. And she was exhausted from fighting for her breath. And when the Catholic priest entered the room that afternoon, he could see that the end was near. And he asked her, would you like me to pray for you? And with every last little bit of energy, she looked at him and said, referring to Jesus Christ, she said, thank you, but I already have a priest. True story. And she's 100 percent right. 100 percent because she understood the scriptures. One of the greatest lies ever told is that salvation comes through the church. See, it's the idea that God works through a select class of priests as they administer the seven sacraments of the church. Baptism, the Eucharist or the Lord's Supper, confirmation, penance, extreme unction or last rites, better known as last rites, marriage, and the holy orders where the Roman Catholics actually believe that Christ's priesthood is continued through the apostles. You need to understand, Christians, that there's a fundamental difference from the faith that we have between the Roman Catholics and the groups and all those groups that follow this doctrine and with what we believe. There's other groups that follow similar doctrine, Greek Orthodox, Russian Orthodox, Church of England, Episcopalian, all offshoots with similar doctrine. It's doctrine that's developed out of thousands of years of traditions rather than just from the scripture itself, like we believe. See, here is kind of what the cliff note version of what happened. In the 4th and 5th centuries, Catholic theologians developed what is called the celestial hierarchy. They believed that everything in the heavens and the earth had its place in a great chain. And it begins with God, and then the archangels, and then the normal angels. And the teaching is that God passes down his knowledge and grace through this chain to the angels, who in turn invest this information in the sacraments and those who administer the sacraments, who then give them to the ordinary lay people. That's where that phrase comes from, lay people. Because the ordinary person does not have, in the Catholic system, direct access to God. And just on a side note, here comes stepping on toes. And just on a side note, run from any teaching, any pastor, any Bible teacher who says we are to keep sacraments. Or that baptism and communion are a means of grace. Grace is separate. Grace is separate. And these ordinances of the church are not a means to God's grace. To head down this direction is to head down the road of works-based salvation, or at the very, very least, works-based sanctification. This is yet another problem with Reformed theology. In the Roman Catholic system, salvation comes through the sacraments and the priests who administer them. 
Priests are then a unique class of individuals who have been gifted by God to contemplate the things of God. But the Anabaptists in the 1500s, they understood the priesthood of the believer. Luther also got some of this right. Good for him. Martin Luther recognized that the Catholic Church was basing its understanding of the priesthood on its traditions, not on the word of God. Luther correctly believed that it is not the offering, the sacrifice of the mass that makes one a priest, but rather it is faith in Jesus Christ, our great high priest, which identifies our roles as priests of God. But Luther still believed in sacraments. He still believed in sacraments as a means of grace. Again, let me say, grace is separate. It cannot be earned and it cannot be sought by human means. Eating the bread and drinking the cup in 1 Corinthians 11 are acts of obedience, but not a means of grace. See, grace by its very definition, friends, is free. Right. It's free, right? The danger in saying that God's grace comes to us through a means is that it brings us back to works. It brings works back into grace. The teaching that grace comes through baptism or communion is a sacramental view of the ordinances. It undermines the very idea of God's grace. Grace is a free gift bestowed upon the undeserving. The sacramental view says that unless you don't do these things, you don't get the grace of God. That's on par with saying you must earn God's grace. That's a problem. I'm going to offer up to you this morning Romans 11, verse 6, because the Apostle Paul kind of already warned on this about 2,000 years ago when he said, and if by grace, then it's no longer of works. Otherwise, grace is no longer grace. But if it is of works, it is no longer grace. Otherwise, work is no longer work. Baptism is obedience. Therefore, it is by definition a work. Receiving communion is obedience to Christ. Therefore, it is also a work. And so when you hear men proclaim that they are means of grace, you are receiving teaching that is antithetical to the grace of God and Scripture. It's grace being redefined by men. Let's get into some scriptures this morning. Hebrews 4.14. Seeing then that we have a great high priest who has passed through the heavens, Jesus, the Son of God, let us hold fast our confession. The Word of God is clearly identifying for us that Jesus Christ is our great high priest. Now, why do you care? Why is this so important? Why does Mark think this is something we need to study? Well, we do need to study. The contrast here is with the Old Testament priesthood. Because implicit in the understanding of the Old Testament, implicit in the understanding of the Mosaic law, is that sin has separated man from God. The priesthood of the Old Testament showed people that they could never have direct access to God. But what the author of Hebrews is showing us is how blessed we are, Christians, in Jesus Christ. The contrast in Hebrews 4 is between Christ and the Old Testament Levitical priest, who once a year passed from the sight of the people into the Holy of Holies bearing the blood atonement. But the Lord Jesus Christ, our great high priest, passed once for all from the sight of all his people at his ascension to the ultimate holy of holies. After shedding his own blood on our behalf, Christ passed through the heavens into the third heaven, into the most holy place, the very presence of God. And once there, he sat down because his work for us is finished. It's over. Listen to how this helps us. Every one of us knows what identity theft is. We all know what identity theft is. And it stinks when it happens to you, doesn't it? It stinks bad. It, it's a horrible thing to realize that someone's taken your name, stolen your name, your personal information to open up a bank account, a credit card on, on your account, in your name, and rack up debt on your behalf. But see what the Bible's telling us is that we are, by definition, people who have someone else's identity. We have someone else's identity. You were given an identity that you were not born with, that you didn't earn the right to use. But you, child of God, are invited to empty the checking account and reap all the benefits of this new identity that it brings. It's an identity gift. 
The gift is the reason Paul could say this in Galatians 2.20. I have been crucified with Christ. It is no longer I who live, but Christ lives in me. And the life which I now live in the flesh, I live by faith in the Son of God who loved me and gave himself for me. The Old Testament, it whispered and it hinted about the priestly office of Christ through types, through shadows. We see this in Aaron, the first high priest of Israel. We also see it in the Levites. Just consider the Day of Atonement found in Leviticus. Aaron had to sacrifice a bull to ceremonially cleanse himself, according to Leviticus 16.11. Then he had to take some of the blood, enter into the Holy of Holies, and sprinkle it on the mercy seat. God instructed him to take two scapegoats and sacrifice one of them, sprinkle its blood on the altar. But the second goat, Aaron, was to lay his hands over it and then sent it out into the camp, into the wilderness, according to Leviticus 16, 21. And then, as verse 22 says, what does it say? It says, the goat shall bear on itself all their iniquities to an uninhabited land, and he shall release the goat into the wilderness. In the progress of revelation, let's talk about what that means. That's actually a pretty important term when it comes to understanding what the Bible is. In the progress of revelation, meaning as God provided more instruction, more detailed revelation to his people as he revealed his written word to us, the prophets began to show that the Messiah was the ultimate sacrifice. So no longer would Israel look to the blood of bulls and goats, but to the blood of the Messiah the Lord Jesus Christ. Isaiah 53 taught the people would be looking upon the Messiah who would be pierced for their transgressions, crushed for their inequities. He would bear our griefs, carry our sorrows. No longer would the scapegoat bear Israel's sins because Jesus, according to Isaiah 53, verse 6, the scripture says, and the Lord has laid on him the iniquity of us all. See, the Messiah would be both the sacrifice and the priest. And Hebrews 9 helps us with this, starting in verse 11. Let's look at this. But Christ came as high priest of the good things to come with the greater and more perfect tabernacle, not made with hands, that is, not of this creation, not with what? The blood of goats and calves, but with his own blood, he entered the most holy place once for all, having obtained eternal Redemption. If you take the time to read the first part of Hebrews 9, you can see the teaching of the limited access to God that the average person had before Christ. But when Jesus Christ came, it's changed everything. The blood of goats and calves could make a person ceremonially clean so they could be in restored fellowship with God and they could worship him again at the tabernacle or at the temple. But it couldn't take away the need for these sacrifices to continue because they would find themselves in this position again. And the blood of these animals could not justify a man before a holy, sinless God in heaven. That took faith in the ultimate sacrifice that was coming, which was what Jesus Christ came to offer. Now, we have seen in Scripture, I have shown you from Scripture, that Christ is our high priest. But here's the question. How does that make us, as believers, priests? Well, there's two key passages in 1 Peter 2 that help us with this. First is 1 Peter 2.9, where it says, But you are a chosen generation, a what? A royal priesthood. Scripture is very clear. We're a royal priesthood, a holy nation, his own special people, that you may proclaim the praises of him who called you out of darkness into his marvelous light. And within the context of Peter's statement, he rests the church's identity as a royal priesthood. Why? Because of our union with Jesus Christ. And this is what he says back in verses 4 and 5. He says, coming to him as to a living stone, rejected indeed by men, but chosen by God and precious, you also as living stones are being built up a spiritual house. Again, what? A holy priesthood to offer up spiritual sacrifices acceptable to God through Jesus Christ. 
See, our priestly office comes because of our identification, that identification gift I was just talking about with Jesus Christ. But as a people, as priests to God, we're no longer to offer up the blood of animals, but rather now it's spiritual sacrifices that we are to offer. We're going to come back to this in a bit, but let's head over to Revelation chapter five. Notice what we read in Revelation five. And they sang a new song saying, you are worthy to take the scroll and to open its seals for you are slain and have redeemed us to God by your blood out of every tribe and tongue and people and nation. Now, what's the implication of Christ's redemptive work? What is one of the things that he accomplished through his blood? Verse 10, and have made us kings and priests to our God, and we shall reign on the earth. Kings and priests to our God. It is our union with Jesus Christ that makes this possible. Now, Peter mentioned spiritual sacrifices. We don't have to offer up bulls and and goats, so you can put those away. But rather, we rest in the finished work of Christ. We rest in Christ, the one true sacrifice. We proclaim the excellencies of God who calls us out of darkness into light, and we offer up our bodies as a living sacrifice. Paul said this in Romans 12, 1. He said, I beseech you, therefore, brethren, these are important words. You should memorize these words. You really should. I beseech you, therefore, brethren, by the mercies of God, that you present your bodies a living sacrifice, holy, acceptable to God, which is your reasonable service. And we read in Hebrews 13, 15. Therefore, by him, let us continually offer the sacrifice of praise to God. That is the fruit of our lips, giving thanks to his name. See, the ultimate sacrifice has already been given by our great high priest. But this means it is now our jobs, Christians, to live for him, praise him and serve him in his grace. And the implications of this teaching of scripture are profound. And the most significant, most significant blessing is that there is no hierarchy of beings, archangels and angels, bishops and priests, standing between the believer and God. Praise be to God. We've been united to Jesus Christ. We are now in fellowship with God. It is now made possible to have fellowship with God through our great high priest, Jesus Christ. Let me show you something significant in the New Testament. And this is a very significant point. It's found over in Matthew 27. And Jesus was on the cross and our Savior had died. Verse 50. And Jesus cried out again with a loud voice and yielded up his spirit. The Lamb of God, our great high priest, offered up his perfect sacrifice. He offered up himself. But then what happened next forever changed forever changed how we interact with our God. Verse 51. Then behold, the veil of the temple was torn in two from top to bottom, and the earth quaked, and the rocks were split. See, when Christ uttered his last breath on the cross, he tore in two the temple veil that shrouded the holy of holies. This was a supernatural event that took place because this was not a small tapestry. This was a large, large hand-woven tapestry. It was 60 feet wide and 20 feet long, and it was the thickness of the palm of your hand. It was thick. Now, there was actually two veils at the temple, one that separated the holy place where the priest could go and the holy of holies where only God could go. And then there was the veil that divided the outside court of the Jews from the court of the Gentiles. Now hear me on this. There was a distinct term that Matthew would have used if he was referring to that outer veil, but he didn't use that terminology. And so I'm telling you that I believe it is the absolute teaching of scripture that this was the inner veil that was torn, demonstrating that God had opened up access to him through his son, the Lord Jesus Christ. Only the high priest could enter the most holy place on behalf of Israel on the day of atonement. And the ripped veil signifies that the Old Testament dispensation had now ended. Man no longer needed a Levitical priest to represent him before God. The sacrificial system was absolutely finished. It was done, done at that moment 
It's finished. I think our Savior said that, didn't he? It's finished. Jesus, this is cool. Listen to this. Jesus died at three o'clock in the afternoon. So this curtain was torn from top to bottom by God at a time when the priests were busy with the evening sacrifice. The priests would have seen this happen and would have been astonished to see it happen. God was declaring to them that their work had come to an end because now the high priest was Jesus, not a mere man. And the time had come for Jesus to enter into the holy of holies of heaven itself with his atoning blood. Tearing this veil from top to bottom, significant, it meant that God himself was ripping it. It was not torn from bottom by men. It was torn from the top by God. It meant the end of the Mosaic system of worship. God was showing this access into his presence was now available to all his people not just the high priest of the Old Testament. This makes me think of a man named Charlie Peace. On July the 4th of 1854, Charlie Peace, a well-known criminal in London, he was hung. Now, the Anglican Church, these guys are very ceremonial. They had a ceremony for everything back then, even a ceremony for hanging people. Who would have thunk? So when, when Charlie Peace was marched to the gallows, a priest read these words from the prayer book. He said this, those who die without Christ experience hell, which is the pain of forever dying without the release, which death itself can bring. And when these chilling words were read, Charlie Peace, he just stopped immediately right in his tracks. He turned to the priest. He shouted in his face. He said, do you believe that? He said it again. Do you believe that? The priest, taken aback by this verbal assault, he stammered for a moment because he wasn't steeped in faith. He was steeped in the rituals of the church. So he weakly responded, well, I suppose, I suppose I do. Well, I don't, Charlie said, but if I did, I'd get down on my hands and knees and crawl all over Great Britain, even if it were paved with pieces of broken glass, if I could rescue one person from what you just told me. That's how I feel, Christians, about the temple veil being torn. That is how I feel about this, because it changes everything. It means I have access to God 24 hours a day, seven days a week even at the hard times, even when it's the hard times. All believers are priests means that every person in the pew, every single believer in Jesus Christ in this church has the right and authority in Jesus Christ to read, to interpret, and apply these teachings of the Bible. It's not a right that is only given to a few. Every person who is united to Christ shares in his priestly office. Now, Let me step on some toes. Let me also give you a warning. All believers are priests. All believers are responsible to minister to God. In this aspect, all believers are equal on level ground at the foot of the cross. But there's a warning. As a community of believers, as a church, this does not mean that there are not differences in roles within the body of Jesus Christ. James 3.1 My brethren, let not many of you become teachers. Everybody's rushing to be a teacher of the word of God today. Let not many of you become teachers, knowing that we will receive a stricter judgment. This verse haunts me. This verse keeps me awake. This is the reason why I put in 30 hours for a message because of this verse. Now, every person who is united to Christ shares in his priestly office, but this does not mean that we reject the the authority, the function and the office of having a pastor. And there are some in every church that abuse the doctrine of the priesthood of believers. There's always a few. Remember what Paul said in Ephesians 4, verses 11 and 12. And he himself gave some to be apostles, some prophets, some evangelists, some pastors and teachers for the equipping of the saints, for the work of the ministry, for the edifying of the body of Christ. Now, what am I getting at? Well, is that there's always some in every church, a tiny minority in this church, to be sure. We really don't have a huge problem with this. But there are some that are still like this in this church that twist this doctrine of the priesthood of believers to try to get their way and undermine the office of the pastor. That always happens because their pride has convinced them that they always know more than the pastor on every single subject. 
especially if they disagree with the pastor on a decision. So let me be direct, perhaps even blunt. I'm told I'm blunt. I don't know. I'm not here for a popularity contest. I don't care, honestly, what you think about me. I don't go home. I mean, I hope you like me. I hope we're friends. I hope we get along great. But I don't go home at night wondering, my gosh, I wonder what they think about me. I'd be insane. But hear me when I say this. I absolutely do care that you learn to respect the office, the position of a pastor. And it's not even for me. It's for the next guy that takes my shoes. Respect the position, the office of a pastor. Because if you don't, Christians, you're undermining the work of Christ. You hurt what we have going here as a church. Now, if you don't like church authority, well, Christ is the one who invented this authority, so take it up with him. He is the one who designed his church. We are all one body, but there are absolutely different roles within the body. Get used to that concept. And every member, every part of the body is needed, which is why Paul said this in 1 Corinthians 12, starting with verse 4. He said, there are diversities of gifts, but the same spirit. There's differences of ministries, but the same Lord. And there are diversities of activities, but it is the same God who works all in all. The priesthood of the believer means we all have direct access to God. Yes, we do. Glory to God. We all have direct access to his word. Praise be to God. But that doesn't mean God doesn't have his leadership in place and doesn't mean we govern the church by mob rule. It doesn't mean that the brand new believer who just gets saved out in the parking lot and has been saved for five minutes, has read their Bible for four minutes, has the correct understanding of everything they're reading. And it's the immature Christian who blasts, who boasts that they disagree with the teaching from the pulpit without first coming and asking for clarification in private. See, the mature believer comes and reasons together in love from the word of God when there's something that they may not understand why it's being taught. We reason together in love. The priesthood of the believer gives us all equal access to God, to the word, but that does not mean that in the church we're in identical roles and authority in what we're teaching. And this is the reason we see in Ephesians 4, pastors and teachers, and this is the reason we see verses like 1 Timothy 5, 17, where it says, let the elders who rule well be counted worthy of double honor, especially those who labor in word and in doctrine. But look at the contrast in 1 Corinthians 3. Written to believers, people always argue, this can't be about believers. Well, Paul calls them brethren. Look at what he says. And I, brethren, could not speak to you as spiritual people, but as to what? Carnal, as to babes in Christ. I fed you with milk and not with solid food, for until now you were not able to receive it. And even now you're still not able for you're still carnal. Or again, from Hebrews 5.12, for though by this time you ought to be teachers, you need someone to teach you again the first principles of the oracles of God, and you have come to need milk and not solid food. Just by simple, simple observation, nothing deep, Scripture's telling us that there are some who are called to teach, and there are some who need teaching. So be clear about this, what I'm saying, that the priesthood of the believers shouldn't fill any one of us with pride. It should humble us, every one of us. Recognize, recognize that we have been given the privilege and the responsibility for how we interact with God's word. We have a privilege and we are responsible for how we interact with God himself and how we live out our faith. And perhaps that is the greatest lesson that we can take from this, that each one of us is responsible for how we interact with God and his word, because that access, it's there. The mission organization, Word Made Flesh, is dedicated to sharing Christ with the poor of the world. And they wrote about a particularly troubling event while walking the streets of Calcutta, India. Their team stumbled across a person lying under filthy, a filthy fly-infested blanket. They discovered that this person had a three-foot trail of diarrhea that was making its way towards the gutter. It was obvious to anyone passing by that the person under the sheet was either dead or was dying. And one of the team members, a man by the name of Josh, he tapped the body, brave soul, he tapped the body on the shoulder to see if the person was dead. And the body moved. 
And Josh pulled the blanket down from the face that it covered to see a helpless young man. He was maybe 22 years old and visibly stunned by their approach. As soon as he realized that they were there to help him, he began to weep uncontrollably. And a crowd gathered and he continued to cry. And one of the team members, a gal by the name of Sarah, she grabbed a bottle of water and some newspapers and she began cleaning off the young man, wiping the diarrhea off with the newspaper and rinsing him with water. We asked him his name, they said, to tell Adas he was lost, he was afraid, he was dying, and he was alone. His body was a leathery skin skeleton. His bulging eyes accentuated the shape of his skull. He kept crying. They tried to get a taxi, but none would stop for this. Not at first. The crowd grew. No one wanted to help. No one at all. And eventually they found a taxi that would take him to a home for the dying. And one of the team members, Chris, said he stood there in disbelief at the sight of this utter depravity. But then it, it got worse because he lifted his head and caught sight of a church and its sign less than five feet from where they found the dying man. And the sign read, all are welcome here. People from the church actually sat and watched as this team helped the dying man. But the entire time their gate remained closed and they never lifted a finger and offered to help. It doesn't sound to me like a body of believers living out their unique role and privilege that we have in Jesus Christ. And can I be honest, neither does much of what the church I see in this country look like that, neither. My mind is going back repeatedly to 1 Peter 2.9. Would you read it again with me? But you are a chosen generation a royal priesthood, a holy nation, his own special people, that you may proclaim the praises of him who called you out of darkness into his marvelous light. Called out of darkness. Called out of darkness into his marvelous light. It means the doctrine of the priesthood of the believers is so that we can proclaim the great salvation that we've received from our God. Sometimes, Christians, that means we're going to have to leave the comfort of our homes and get our hands dirty for Jesus Christ. The priesthood of the believers is one of the most important doctrines in the Christian faith. We have been trusted with an incredible gift, God's grace, God's word, God's presence in our lives. And we will give an account as believers not to determine our eternal destiny, if we're in Christ, that's already settled. But to determine our rewards or lack of rewards for how we used what God has given us in his grace. So I, I hope this. I hope you as a Christian learn to embrace the grace of God in your life. I hope that you learn to take advantage of the privilege you have as a believer in reading the word of God. Netflix has nothing on the word of God, right? Shut Netflix off. Read the word of God. And I hope you take advantage of the privilege of introducing others to Jesus Christ. As Paul says in 2 Corinthians 5.20, Now then, we are ambassadors for Christ. As though God were pleading through us, we implore you on Christ's behalf, be reconciled to God. Return to the Word Ministries is committed to teaching the full counsel of God's Word and the gospel of Jesus Christ. For more about our ministry, please visit returntotheword.com. Return to the Word is a faith ministry. This means we freely distribute the teaching of the Word of God over the air and online. We do this without charge. If you feel led to support the ministry with a donation to help cover these costs, you may do so on our website, returntotheword.com, or by mailing a donation to Return to the Word, P.O. Box 879259, Wasilla, Alaska, 99687. Thanks for listening, and we pray that the Word of God will be a lamp unto your feet and a light unto your path.
Join us next time for another edition of Return to the Word.